Welcome to the Open Forum, a telephone talk program designed to give you the opportunity to ask questions and discuss issues related to the Bible. Our host is Harold Camping of Family Stations Incorporated. The phone number is 1-800-322-5385. That's 1-800-322-5385. When you call, allow the phone to keep ringing. Your call will be answered when it is time for you to be on the air. When your call is taken, please be ready to turn your volume down. Our phone number is 1-800-322-5385. Now we present Open Forum with our host and Bible teacher, Harold Camping. Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? What subject is of concern to you? The Bible is our authority. The Bible is the book that God has given us that is the king of all books. The Bible is the book of infinite wisdom. The Bible is the voice of God, almighty God who rules over this universe and is from everlasting past and goes on into everlasting future. The Bible is written by the very God with whom every human has to do with. That is, we all have to answer to God as to how we lived out our lives because we were created in the image of God. Therefore, it is so wonderful that we can learn something about ourselves right from the mouth of God. We can learn something about God right from the mouth of God. We can learn something about our relationship to Him and how uh, our troubles uh, in relationship to God are and how these can be solved. All of this can be found in the Bible. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it wonderful that we can use this wonderful book as the authority for this program. Well, before we take our first call tonight, we have a question here that comes out of India. And the question is concerning a verse in Psalm 8. It's a very puzzling situation because in Psalm 8, verse 5 or verse 4, let's begin with verse 4, the question is, what is the meaning that uh, that we read here of what we read here in Psalm 8 verse 5 that God made him whoever that is a little lower than the angels as a matter of fact we read in Psalm 8 verse uh, 4 what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him for thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor now this, and it goes on, Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. This verse is quoted in Hebrews chapter 2, and that creates a problem, a real problem, because in Hebrews chapter 2, we read again, in uh, as uh, uh, in verse six, Hebrews two, verse six, but one in a certain place testified, saying, "What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and and did set him over the works of thy hands, uh, and so on." Well, now so far you don't see a problem. And this is because uh, of the way these verses were translated. But in actuality, the verse in Psalm 8 in the Hebrew is, it goes this way. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than God. God and has crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. And so we wonder how could God use the word God here 
and angels in Hebrews chapter 2. Well, the fact is, the, the Greek word that's used in Hebrews 2 is the word angelus, which is angel, or which could be translated messenger. And so we wonder how we can reconcile this. It appears as if the translators, knowing that this verse was quoted in Hebrews chapter 2, and, and God gave the word angels, Therefore, somehow, somehow, the word in Psalm 8, verse 4, should, or verse 5, should also have been angels, even though the Hebrew word is Elohim, which is a name for God. It's the same word that we read in uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So... Uh, we can see, therefore, that this is a very puzzling situation. Uh, and on the other hand, there are those who look at these verses and say, Oh, well, man here is a human race. We are lower than the angels, and we are lower than God. That solves our problem. But that doesn't solve the problem, because in Hebrews 2, we read in verse 8, as it continues, Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, singular, for in that he put all things all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him, but now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Oh, we see that these verses, therefore, are talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. If we were going to paraphrase this, we would say, looking again at Psalm 8, What is Jesus, that thou art mindful of him? And the Son of Man, who is Jesus, that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than God, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Well, we know the last phrase makes sense, because... We read in Ephesians chapter 1, When Christ rose from the grave, he sat down at the right hand of God and was given authority over everything, not only in this age, but in the age to come. Everything was put under subjection unto him. But we don't see this, as we read in Hebrews chapter 2, until Christ comes again. And he brings this world into judgment and creates the new heaven and the new earth. And then we see Jesus, as verse 9, Hebrews 2 speaks, that he will be crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death, death for every man, that is, for everyone who is to become saved. When we combine these two passages, we therefore find, number one, God is not talking about human beings of the human race, that is, uh, uh, any of us. He is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, who emptied himself of his glory, making himself less than uh, the God that he was in heaven, that is, he was stripped of his glory, he was still God, but he, he, he humbled himself and became the suffering servant. He became lower than the angels, or, uh, and he became lower than God himself. But that he will be the one who will be crowned with glory and honor, and we will, uh, he earned this by going to the cross, uh, but we will not see it in its full display until the end of the world. And I think now we've got become, we've come very close to the truth of what these passages are speaking of. Thank you, India, for that interesting verse or interesting question. And now shall we go to our telephone lines and take our first call from our 
telephone lines. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. Good evening. Yes. I had uh, three questions, please. Yes. Uh, there are some Christians who believe that the Lord Jesus Christ will not return until the Jews will build their temple. Uh, how true is that, please? Well, the fact is that there is no possibility of this. Uh, there's no statement anywhere in the Bible that the physical temple will be rebuilt. Uh, and as a matter of fact, isn't it interesting that if, if uh, the Temple Mount where the Jews would rebuild it if they were able to do it is occupied today by the Dome of the Rock, which is a Muslim temple. And in order to rebuild the temple, they would have to destroy that that uh, 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 Muslim temple and that would bring the whole Mohammedan world against them it's it's physically an impossibility but secondly it is not predicted in any sense as a literal statement that he will rebuild that temple when the Bible talks about him building the temple we read about that temple in 1st Corinthians 3 that temple is the 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 churches and congregations that Christ came. And uh, as we read in 1 Timothy, Timothy, Corinthians 3, Christ was the, was the foundation, and, uh, and the ones who become saved are building blocks in that temple. They are, uh, wood, or they are wood, hay, and stubble if they're not saved, or they're gold, silver, and precious stones if they are saved. And then in that connection... God says in verse 16 of 1 Corinthians 3, Know ye not that ye, that all of you who are building blocks in the temple, are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you, in all of you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Uh, for the temple of God is holy, which ye are. And that ye is plural, it's all of you together are the temple. And this is referring to the, uh, to the body of believers. Let me see what Ephesians chapter 2 has to say about that. We read in Ephesians chapter 2 uh, in verse uh, uh, 19. Now therefore ye, that is you Gentiles are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints. And of, uh, let me see, let me see, is he talking about the Gentiles or the Jews? It makes no difference because he's talking in this context that the middle wall of partition has been broken down. And now I, I, both you Jews and Gentiles is, the, is what the uh, uh, verse is addressing. Uh, now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. That foundation is the word of God, Jesus Christ himself being the chief corner, in whom all the building fit, fitly framed together groweth into an holy temple in the Lord in whom ye are also builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. God here is therefore speaking of the churches and congregations throughout the church age as being the fulfillment of any prophecy that has to do with a future building of the temple. Okay. Uh, my second question was actually, um, also I just heard some um, evangelists talking about loving one another, and one of them said that we are supposed to love Christians more than other people. And I don't know if we're supposed to love our enemies. How, how should we love Christians more than the non-Christians? Well, the, the, that is something the Bible does not teach, that we love Christians more than someone else. The Bible says we are to love our enemies. The word love there is the same word that uh, God uses, for example, when we are told to love God, or when uh, it speaks of God's love for us. And so uh, the principle is uh, to love someone, we want the highest good for them. We want... Uh, we want the very best for them, and the very best for 
uh, for those who we think are believers, who are our friends, our loved ones, as well as those who are enemies, is uh, what we desire for them is that they might become saved. Yes. Um, okay, my, my third question was actually, um, have you heard about the Gospel of St. Thomas? Um, I don't know if it's a valid one, or should we just read it? or. Uh, if anything that purports to be left out of the Bible or something, don't take your, don't waste your time reading it. All it'll do is confuse you. It is not a part of the Bible. It has no uh, authenticity, uh, authenticity as the Bible does. It is not the Word of God. Uh, if you want to read it, read it as just a historical book, like if you read Josephus. Or if you read uh, uh, any any uh, historical book that has been written by secular writers, uh, you can read it that way. But do not read it in any sense as being the Word of God. Okay, thank you very much, Brother Kemp. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yes, good evening. How you doing, Brother Captain? Very well, thank you. Yeah, I have a couple questions for you. Yeah. Uh, now, there's a passage, uh, I think it's in Galatians, Galatians 8, 1, or 1, 8. It's, it, it has to do with uh, things that are written in the book. Cursed is the man that, that doesn't, I don't know if I have this right, cursed is the man that doesn't obey these commands or something to that nature. Um, that's not one eight, and, and this certainly can't be eight one. Okay. Uh, Galatians one eight says, "But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, uh, let him be accursed." So okay. I just I just don't know which verse you're talking about. Oh, okay. All right. Another question. Uh, how about when uh, Christ is talking to to uh, when, when when they're in front of Christ and he says, uh, uh, they says, well, I cast out demons in your name, and, and we did this and we did that, and he says, I know you not. Uh, who, who is he talking to? Well, you see, that's a quotation from Matthew chapter 7. And Christ is warning there that someday there's going to be uh, uh, the final trial. Uh, and uh, there will be people... If someone has truly become saved, they will not stand for trial at the judgment throne of God because they, uh, their sins have all been taken by the Lord Jesus and the Lord Jesus has already stood for trial on their behalf and was found guilty and God already poured the, his punishment upon Christ as payment for those sins of these individuals. But on the other hand, anyone who is not saved is going to have to stand for trial on the last day and answer for his sins, uh, and they're going to be found guilty. Well, there, to a uh, great many people's surprise, they're going to have to appear before the judgment throne and stand for trial. And they're going to be asking, how can this be? How can this be? Why, I was a Christian. I... I uh, I, I declared the word of God in the name of Jesus. I I did many mighty works in the name of Jesus. Why I even cast out demons in the name of Jesus. How could it be that I have to stand for trial? I was positive that I was saved. And Christ is going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. I never knew you. In other words, you thought you were saved. But I didn't save you. You had your own salvation plan, and that didn't get you right with God, and so you still have to answer to God. Uh, in other words, it is a huge warning. Make sure that you have uh, the salvation that God provides and not some kind of a man-made salvation that uh, will not forgive, uh, relieve you of your guilt. And if you have a man-made salvation, uh, you're, it's, you're still going to stand for trial. You're going to be found guilty. And then, of course, it's, it's too late, too late 
for salvation. There's no mercy anymore, and it's guaranteed you'll be cast into eternal damnation. I, I found that verse I was talking about, Brother Camden. Um, it's uh, Galatians 3.10. Galatians 3.10. There we read, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Well, yes, you see, if we're trying to get saved by our good works, I did this, I did that, I prayed the right kind of prayer, I, uh, I uh, have really learned to trust in Christ, I, uh, I uh, go to church regularly, I got baptized in water, I made confession of faith, I, I regularly partook of the Lord's Supper, I did all these things, and, and therefore, certainly, I must be a child of God. Uh, where, what I'm trusting in is the good works that I did, rather than the fact I'm a miserable sinner that does not deserve salvation, and, and if I'm saved, it means only Christ could have done all the work in saving me. And so this, again, is a warning that if you're trusting... And what you have done uh, to, to guarantee your salvation, you're still going to be under the curse of God. Okay. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, good evening, Brother Camping. I, I have uh, a question about uh, the Book of Kings concerning, again, the church age. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Solomon going apostate with his zillions of uh, wives and concubines. Is that a picture of the church uh, having uh, it all the different high places as perhaps Solomon? I don't think so. I think it's uh, God is using Solomon as a picture of Christ building the temple. That was the big task that God gave Solomon to do. And the 700 wives and 300 concubines are a, even though it was wrong on Solomon's part, yet God took that wrong thing and made it a picture of a glorious uh, fact, and that is Christ as his bride, people from every nation, from all over the world. The 700 and the 300 are for a total of a thousand, represented the complete a complete character of the bride of Christ that is made up of believers from every nation. I think that's the way we have to look at that. Oh, well, thank you for clarifying that. Have a good evening. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, uh, Mr. Caffey. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to uh, talk about the subject in uh, Ezekiel. Excuse me. Could you turn your radio off, please? Yes. Ezekiel 28. Me. Could you turn your radio I off? It is off. Okay, we got a lot of uh, hash on the phone line. But let's okay, try. Hold on. Okay. Okay, Ezekiel 28, 13, and 14. Yeah, Ezekiel 28, 13, and 14 is talking about mankind. Thou hast been in Eden. Now, who was put in the Garden of Eden? Adam and Eve, our first parents. Now, it's true that Satan put in an appearance there, but he uh, that was just very brief. The fact is that Adam and Eve lived in the Garden of Eden, and, uh, and they were perfect. It says, Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and diamond, and so on. In other words, Adam and Eve were... When they were created, God saw that everything was very good. Then he said in verse 14, Thou art the anointed cherub. Now the cherub in the Bible is a picture of God as the judge. As the judge. And, uh, and uh, 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 angels are not those who are going to judge. And Satan was a fallen angel. So he cannot identify with the cherub. It is true that many theologians read about the seraphim and the cherubim and, and conclude that they are 
somehow uh, uh, levels of angels, but they are, that's not possible. As we look where those cherubim and seraphim are shown in the Bible, they could never be angels. They have to be God himself. And, uh, and uh, uh, mankind was created in the image of God, in the likeness of God. And therefore, God can say you, that, you, that we were the anointed cherub that covereth. Now, covereth it means that uh, we were created to be our brother's keeper. We have a concern for each other. Of course, when mankind rebelled against God, they abandoned that concern altogether. But, and we see this as, as Cain, remember, said, uh, Am I my brother's keeper? When he was accused of killing Abel, his brother. Uh, that covering, uh, mankind did not carry that out the way they should. But when God created man, we were created in the image of God. And we, with a natural, uh, in, in our perfected, per, uh, perfect state, with a natural desire of having that kind of a deep concern for each other. And Christ, of course, came as the covering. He came as the, as the true uh, picture of what man should have been. And so this is, this is talking about mankind. There, under no circumstance could it be talking about Satan. Okay. Uh, I noticed that in uh, Isaiah 14... Verse 11, it mentions about the noise of thy viols. And I know the viols is a, is a musical instrument. And then in uh, Ezekiel 28:13, it talks about uh, the workmanship of thy tablets and thy pipes. Could that, is there any correlation to that? Uh, well, the, the, don't, don't, the, the mention of a musical instrument is not, uh, is not uh, conclusive at all. Because we read of musical instruments in connection with David and and with uh, with beautiful things that have to do with the gospel, it simply is emphasizing that musical instruments were used both by Satan as well as by or that is wicked people just as by believers, and we see this today all through the world. But that in itself is is not a conclusive statement that points to either side. Okay, I have another question. Uh, you mentioned that in the church age that where Satan seats that the Holy Spirit cannot dwell, right? During That's the church correct, age, right? the, the Holy Spirit is not active in the churches and congregations. He has been taken out of the midst. What if a person like is a, a smoker or, or is defiling his body with the tongue? And yet he says he's a Christian, so in his body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Can uh, can the Holy Spirit dwell within a, a, a person who's like a smoker who's defiling his body? Well, but the fact is that just because somebody says they're a Christian does not make them a Christian. The only ones who are true Christians are the people that God has saved. And if God has saved us, it will show up in our life. We're continuing with the Open Forum, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Campy? Yes. I'm still here. Okay. Yeah, uh, you didn't really answer the question. Um, I said if a person like is a, is a smoker, right, and and they, they are a believer, they say they're a believer, right, and the Holy Spirit is supposed to dwell in the believer, but... Cigarettes, tobacco smoke, I believe, is uh, it's like you said, it's a god, right? And you, you say if it's a god, Satan, I mean, the Holy Spirit cannot dwell well, with Satan is in the midst. So yeah. can a person that is a smoker and says they're a believer have the Holy Spirit? Well, I, you know, it, I can't make a judgment about any individual. I have known people who smoked and uh, and. Uh, there was all kinds of evidence that they were a child of God. They didn't realize that smoking was bad for them. And and then when they found out it was bad for them, then they stopped smoking. Now, if someone can't get victory over it, it is very suspicious. And uh, But I'm, uh, don't, don't judge anyone else. Look at your own life. 
maybe that's not your problem, but you may have some other problems that you are, have to wrestle with. But the fact is that if I knew, if I believed I were a believer and I could not get victory over smoking, I would be very fearful. I would be trembling before God. How can it be that I call myself a believer uh, and yet I, I have my trust in this, uh, I'm still a slave of nicotine and and it is it it is very suspicious but i'm not going to make a judgment of someone else but shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum hello brother camping um yes. i'm calling uh in less time than a month and i apologize but i have some very important uh questions to ask before the lord's day on sunday um i'm a believer excuse and, me um, excuse me excuse me now why do you do that you know we're trying to uh, let uh, 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 many people have an opportunity to call you know full well that the rule is that we try to call once a month and now you uh, you think you have important questions but you put me on a spot uh, because uh, uh, we're trying to maintain the rule and so you're a bad example and it makes it difficult to even try to help you with your questions why why don't why couldn't you wait for a couple of weeks to ask your questions they'll uh, they'll hold for another time I'm, I'm sorry now I'll, I'll, I'll answer one of your questions what is your question that you want to address Well, thank you for calling, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I've been listening to the program here, and, uh, and uh, well, I, 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 I'm see, I seem to be one that would, uh, would like to share the word of the Lord with others and not force it uh, upon them. And uh, you do a very good job at that, and I want to commend you for that. That's, 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 uh, that's something that uh, you very, see very rarely. <clears throat> but uh, I, I would like to know if you have a question. Is there anything that, would, that you ever had questions of in the scriptures? And Well, of course, as I read the Bible, there are always questions that, are, that I'm struggling with, that I, there are verses that I don't really feel confident I know the meaning and yet and so I'm praying for wisdom from the Lord to try to provide an answer but uh, 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 this the nature of this program is that we want to find uh, uh, give people opportunity to ask their questions now you want to share the word uh, you, and you don't want to force it upon them I would say that the, uh, family radio offers is a, a, a marvelous opportunity for this number one uh, people join together in supporting family radio it's their opportunity to share the gospel with a gospel with the whole world or again they if they individually want to become even more personal about it they can they can write in or call in for some of our does God love you tracks and stand out on the street corner in the marketplace or wherever and pass the, those tracks out and that's a wonderful way to share the word without forcing it upon anyone at all you are correct of course that we don't want to force the this gospel on anyone exactly and of our own free will and uh, now now I have one last thing to just just a comment and uh, uh, at, at the end of my life or or when it's time for me to not be upon earth is physically speaking about the only thing I can recall that the scripture says that will be with me will be the Holy Spirit that is in me. And, uh, and even the knowledge that I do and attain, and that uh, uh, even if I study the scriptures from the time I could read until the day of my death, all this knowledge that I attain, and it, 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 will, mean, it will mean nothing except this. If I kept the Lord's commandments, which are the two, which is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, and so that uh, that that is that that new covenant. That even if I don't know what all the scriptures uh, in the Book of Revelations, what what it all might mean. Yeah. Well, that, excuse me. Yeah. Excuse me. I, the fact is that what you learn from the scriptures 
is not a waste at all. It's not something that's just gone. We read in in uh, 1 Corinthians 13. Now we see in a glass darkly. That is, we don't that we don't understand the scriptures uh, nearly as perfectly as we will when we are face to face with Him. Now we see us in a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now we know in part, then we. Uh, and and uh, we prophesy in part because we only know in part, but uh, but uh, we already have have uh, some knowledge of the glory of God, some knowledge of the character of salvation, some knowledge of our sins, some knowledge of a whole lot of things, and and uh, that we don't lose that. We simply that becomes magnified and and completed when we are with the Lord Jesus Christ. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. God bless you, Brother Hal. Uh, I'm glad that you changed the way the telephone system works. It seems that uh, you don't have to wait as long to get on the air. And that's, that's a really good thing for somebody. Well, uh, I would get, like to... excuse me, it depends. There are people who've tried and tried and tried and tried. And we had nothing to do with this. The telephone company... Uh, uh, what happened was that in years past that uh, many, many people would try to call and they'd stay on the line and that would load up all of the telephone lines in a, in a big way that was very detrimental to, to the whole telephone system. And so they made the rule, we did not make it, but they made the rule that after, after so many minutes of hanging on, you, your line drops off. Uh, that is, you, uh, you uh, no longer are on the line, and then you have to dial it again. And so this, uh, this makes it possible for some people to call in. <laughs> and they, they call in, and, and two seconds later, uh, they're they're in, connected because someone else just fell away and they just happened to get there at the right moment. So it isn't quite as wonderful as it sounds, but anyway, I'm glad that you are pleased with it. Oh, Brother Harold, uh, I thought it was something Family Radio did. Now that I know it's from the telephone company, yes. I know the Lord's hands upon that. Yeah, I hope it works out for all of the listeners and callers because uh, we we really need to get as many people as we can, as many minds going on the Word of God. But I would like to look at Ecclesiastics chapter 11, verses 1 through 4 this evening, Brother Harold. Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Let's look at that. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verses 1 to 4. There we read, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Give a portion to seven, and also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if the tree fall toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. He that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the cloud shall not reap. Now, what is your what is your question, Brother Harold? In my Bible. In verse 3, the word themselves is italicized. Right. Which means that in the original text, it, that word is not there. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. Um, if the clouds be full of rain, they empty upon the earth. Am I to understand in the spiritual sense that the clouds are the true believers who are delivering the rain, which is the gospel? No. No. Okay. Can you no, explain that to me then, Brother Harold, please? Yeah. Well, look at, go back to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 32. We read in verse 2. My doctrine shall drop as rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as a small rain upon a tender herb, herb, and as it showers upon the grass. Now, where does the teaching of the Bible come from? It comes from heaven. It is given by God. Just like the rain comes from heaven. Uh, the clouds are, uh, are the, the believers are not clouds. The believers are, are a vehicle God uses, but ultimately the gospel comes from God himself. 
and uh, and uh, and uh, God speaks about clouds because the gospel is in the setting of the fact that God is a just God and people have to answer for their sins uh, and uh, it is uh, uh, as we bring the gospel we the the the, the uh, purpose of the gospel is to recognize to rescue people from the wrath of God clouds have to do with judgment but it is uh, it out of judgment flows the salvation and of course it also un underscores that that the gospel comes because Christ endured judgment for us but uh, the clouds are full of rain and empty upon the earth that has to do just strictly with with the gospel as God brings it now, although he does use believers as the carriers or the uh, vehicle uh, to spread it out upon the earth that's excellent brother Harold great answer it helps me tremendously going back to Ecclesiastes 11 in verse 2 I've noticed in other portions of scripture where he says give a portion to seven and also to eight in the Proverbs he does that also the, the Lord will say six and then he'll say also seven what is the purpose of the Lord telling us seven and then also eight I don't understand that that I concept I, I'm sorry I don't know how to answer your question I have seen that many times yeah. or not, not many times but I see it I think in the book of Amos or someplace there and also I see it here in Ecclesiastes and but I I don't uh, I have not at this point in time understood exactly why God phrased it that way I have to leave that alone otherwise I'll be speculating brother Harold he um, in numerology you have taught um me now i don't want to make this apply if it doesn't apply but the number seven has to deal with the completeness of god's plan he created the earth in seven days and the number eight is new beginning would that apply here or should i leave that alone well it may it may but that incidentally that's not numerology numerology is a phrase that identifies with assigning uh, uh, number values to the letters of the Hebrew alphabet or to the Greek alphabet and that has no place at all in biblical understanding but uh, the assignment of uh, meaning to numbers uh, as we uh, as you've indicated seven is the number of perfection that we know uh, works because uh, God assigns meaning to words and numbers our words and so uh, but but why uh, he does this seven and eight I I really uh, don't want to speculate about that but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum good evening mr. Caffey this is Jack again I've been listening to you on channel 19 on cable at four o'clock on Saturdays uh, I wanted to answer the, some of the questions that you uh, had on the, fir on the first couple of calls. I want to remind us that in First John it says, If we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But he who is just shall have eternal life and breathe with me. Can you comment on that? Well, yes. If we, if we uh, think we have no sin, then we don't need a savior and uh, and we're deceiving ourselves because the bible clearly says that there is none righteous no not one and and we're all in trouble with our sins now if if we confess our sins uh, that is to confess our sins means to be of the same mind with god and we'll only be of the same mind with god if he has saved us he has been faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness confession is not admission of sin it means to admit but also to be of the same mind with god that sin uh, i don't want any sin in my life and that will only happen uh, when god has saved us and given us a new resurrected soul Ah, uh, yes, and also, can you comment on communion when we take the body and blood of our Lord? Well, there again, that's a, a, that's a a shadow. It's a it's a sign. It has no substance in itself. 
as often as you do this, do so in remembrance of me. Even as we partake of physical food and drink and it gives us physical life, so we are to, uh, to uh, uh, partake of the life of Christ. And, that, and we only do that when God saves us. He, he is the one who gives us life because he gave his life. He endured the second death in order that we might have eternal life. And so that communion service is simply pointing to what Christ has done in saving us. It, 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 the fact that we're partaking of communion doesn't is not a guarantee of any kind that we become saved, nor does it make us or closer to salvation or anything like that. It is simply a, a picture of, uh, of salvation. Okay, thank you very much, and thank I hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome yes. to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Camping. Yeah. Yeah, um, my question is, was salvation in the Old Testament and salvation today in Christian time the same? What I mean is, were people saved by grace? As you know, we learn from the Bible that we are saved by grace today. The fact is, absolutely yes. We read of Noah, who lived uh, uh, 5,000 years before Christ came. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, we read in Acts chapter 4, there is no other name given under heaven among men whereby we might be saved. And that, uh, that name is the Lord Jesus. There's only one way, and that is through Christ. Now, remember that in principle, Christ is the Lamb that was slain from before the foundation of the earth. That means the washing power of the blood of Christ, or the fact that he gave his life, was available from the very moment that Adam and Eve sinned. Uh, it was available to the Old Testament people just as well as to us. Yeah, okay, the last question is, um, is probably personal. I want to know which school of scripture interpretation are you from? Because they have like the dispensation list and then the different school. Well, I don't belong to any school. I belong to the biblical school. I don't identify with this or that or the other thing. To me, it, uh, the Bible is the authority. It's as simple as that. The whole Bible is the authority, and we keep comparing Scripture with Scripture. And uh, and uh, I, I, if it, it is true that during the church age there were theologians that identified with one school of thought, another one identified with another school of thought. Much like in philosophies, one can say, well, I am of the school of Plato, I'm of the school of, uh, of Euripides or uh, somebody else, and everybody respects the other one even though they disagree about some things, and that's the way it's been in the churches. But but that that doesn't make any sense because there's only one truth and we want to find that truth and that truth is the Bible and so it's not what school I belong to but what am I check, studying the Bible carefully carefully comparing scripture with scripture and and uh, and to, trying to get as close as I can to truth all the way through Thank you very much, Mr. Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Hi, Welcome. Yes. My yes. name is Tommy Rodriguez, and I need some help on a question. Yes. Um, actually, it's two short questions. Uh, first question, I was hoping for you to answer. When I was 17, um, I tried to commit suicide, and I took sleep pills, but I died on my living room floor. And I woke up a week later in the hospital. And when I woke up, my mom said that I supposedly had said that it was warm and it was beautiful and I didn't want to come back. So I figured maybe God has a mission for me. And I've been waiting for a sign or I'm not a crazy person or nothing. Can you help me with this? Well, the fact is you're, God isn't going to give you a sign. We should never be looking for signs. 
we have to look at the Bible to find out where truth is. And the truth is that you, like every other human being by nature, are a sinner. You're under the wrath of God. You're in trouble. And you have a, and and uh, in your desperation, in your uh, you uh, even tried to take your life. By God's mercy, He didn't He didn't allow you to die. That was the mercy of God. Uh, and and why he why he didn't allow you to die? That's God's business. But the fact is. Uh, it's still the day of salvation, and if there, if I were in your shoes, I would be reading the Bible and reading the Bible and reading the Bible, because that is the voice of God. You want to hear from Almighty God. What does He want with me? And you're going to learn about that by reading the Bible and uh, and praying, Oh Lord, have mercy on me, and praying, help me to be obedient to what I find there. That's that is the uh, that's the, uh, the the best thing that any human can do is is read the Bible carefully, prayerfully. As a matter of fact, even if we're really busy working and and uh, our life is so filled with the things of this world, every Sunday is a day, 24 hours long, that God has carved out of the seven day week that is to be set aside just for this purpose. To, to have time to read the Bible and read and read and pray and sing and, and uh, share, share the, the gospel with others and visit with others uh, uh, to encourage them and so on. Uh, God has, has given us the means to do this. Okay. I have a short, uh, another question for you. Can I ask you? Yes. Okay. Actually, this is from me and my friend Larry. We both want to know, and hopefully you can answer it for us. When God reveals truth to us, does that mean that the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us, teaching us, or can it be possible for the Holy Spirit to lead us into truth from heaven? Well, the fact is, if we can learn a whole lot of things without without ever the Holy Spirit ever working in our life, that. Right? There are people who know all kinds of things about the Bible, but they're not saved, and that means that the Holy Spirit is not in their life at all. Uh, the fact you know some things from the Bible, that's not any evidence. The evidence of the Holy Spirit being in your life is the evidence of salvation, because the Holy Spirit comes to indwell those who have become saved. And the nature of of the one who has become saved is that he has a delight in the Word of God and he, he, he wants to know everything he can uh, and as he, as he discovers anything from the Word of God he has an earnest ongoing desire to be obedient to that uh, and this is the nature you know he won't be perfectly obedient but if he if he fails somewhere then he feels real badly and and he's praying the Lord for for strength and for wisdom so that I'll do it I, I won't go that path again and he'll uh, he has a, a real desire uh, to do the will of God that translates into a more and more obedient life but if you if we have no interest in reading the Bible or if we or if we have very little interest and in, basically we just want to uh, uh, live our life uh, to enjoy it as much as possible the likelihood is we have no relationship with Christ at all I'm placing my life around God because all my life I've been screwed up and every night I go to bed before I go to bed I get down on my knees and I uh, thank God for helping me make it through another day and um, well, the fact is, I, I I believe I've been saved for a long, 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 long time. And every day I have to pray, Oh, Lord, uh, I don't trust myself. Oh, Lord, give me wisdom. Oh, Lord, help me to do it your way more than I did yesterday. And that is the the nature of the child of God. He has an ongoing desire to do the will of God. But because we have that honest desire this is not just lip service this is not just saying words 
uh, it means also that then I'm going to be reading the Bible. How, after all, this is God's book. This is God. This is the way God can speak to me. And now I, I believe I love the Lord, and so I want to hear from Him. I really want to hear what He has to say. And so I, I'm delighted when I can spend time in the Word of God. And, uh, and if we are simply praying and, and we have no interest in the Word of God, well, yeah, we're, we're just deceiving ourselves. We think that, that we're really on the right track when really, really uh, we're just paying lip service to the idea that Christ is my Savior. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Brother Camping. Yes. Uh, my question is in Psalms 146.3, I believe it is, uh, it talks about not putting your trust in the Son of Man. Which Son of Man is that? Well, is that, is that Psalm 146 or 144? I thought it was 146.3. Yeah, well, let me look and see once. Uh, put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth. In this case, it is speaking about mankind in general. It's uh, 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 his breath goeth forth, he returneth to the earth. In that very day his thoughts perish. It's the con context clearly shows that this phrase, Son of Man, is referring to mankind. Now, there are other times when God uses the term Son of Man, and he refers to Christ. But we have to look at the context. We're continuing with the Open Forum program, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Brother Camping. Um, I have a couple questions. Um... I've heard you say before that intellectually that a person could want to be saved. Now, I guess my question it relates to myself. I enjoy the open forum um, yeah, about eight or nine years ago, flipping through the radio. I happened to catch the open forum, and I've been listening to family radio ever since. And I was born and raised in the church, and I was obviously under the belief that, well, if you do good, everybody goes to heaven, obviously, until I heard family radio and started studying the Bible. I listen to what family radio and what the open forum has to say and i do just like you said i i follow you up i check it in the bible and everything that you pretty much says that you say is i, I can see it as being the truth when i look at it in the bible because a lot of people that i've invited to listen to family radio they they have a problem with what family radio teaches but for some reason i just don't really believe that I'm saved. I, I don't know. I, I enjoy reading the Bible. I, every time I find something new, it excites me. I mean, I, I do my own writings just so I can have uh, quick references to things that I want when I want to share some things out of the Bible. How do I know that I'm just not intellectually... How, how do I know that... You, you understand what, what the I understand. I'm, you know... I, I'm reminded of Romans chapter 8 where God says that God's Spirit will witness with our spirit that we are sons of God. Now, how does God's Spirit work? Well, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. The only thing I can suggest to you is you keep reading the Bible. Keep reading the Bible and, and uh, 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 pray the Lord that He might give you that uh, sense of of belonging to him that you are a child of God uh, if you keep reading the Bible God's Spirit will witness with your spirit that you are a child of God there will be more and more a settled feeling in your soul I must be right with God because I find this desire to do God's will I, I find that when I sin it is such a, a an enormous uh, difficulty to me I'm happiest when I do it God's way and uh, and so on, uh, but wait upon the Lord. The, the 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 test of the whole matter is not how I feel. The test of the matter is have I truly become saved? And and all I know is is that the closer I live to Christ, the uh, more logical it would be that I that I have become a child of God. Okay, and finally. Um 
the the again reading the Bible and and learning different things. I used to uh, shop and go to the mall and go out to restaurants on Sundays. And now um, with the end of the church era, and when I you know people ask me, especially in my family, my wife, and I point these things out to other people, they can't see it or they they have a problem with the fact that I'm trying to do it the Lord's way. I, I feel that Sunday I shouldn't go out to the store because that's causing somebody else to work. I should do everything, get everything that I need to do on a Saturday. How do I show them in the Bible that this is what God says and, and well, point well, out because you clearly teach about the end of the church era and when you read it, the scriptures that you give, you can you can see what it's saying. How do how do I relay that to people because I can't get them to listen to family radio. Well, that's a problem. See, we can't get anybody to become a believer. We can witness to them but but uh we can't we it's like leading a horse. We can lead a horse to water but we can't make them drink. And uh, the, we uh, uh, we uh, we can tell them about these things, but we can't make them understand or desire uh, or whatever. We simply witness, and then we leave it with the Lord. Now, in your own mind, in your own life, you know why it is that you have this desire. We read in Isaiah 58, verse 13, and the context clearly shows this is talking about the new the whole New Testament age, then uh, that where it says, If thou turn thy foot away from the Sabbath, that is, turn away your will, my own will from this Sabbath day, from doing mm, uh, thy pleasure on my holy day. Christ is saying the Sabbath is my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou light, delight thyself in the Lord. Now, if we're a true child of God, we read this and we say, Oh, that's why God has given us Sunday. It's, it's His holy day. And it's not for my pleasure. That's why I don't go to a restaurant on Sunday. That's why I don't use this day to catch up on all of the... Uh, the goodies that I didn't have time during the week to do. This is why I, I, uh, this is a day I can read the Bible and I can pray and, and my, I welcome this day because uh, through the week I get so busy and, and even when I'm home the phone rings and, and so on. But, but Sunday, that's, I got the whole day ahead of me just to me with my family talk about the things of the Lord and, and, uh, and read, and read the Bible together and maybe uh, find another family that uh, thinks alike and we can fellowship together and so on. And this is, this, uh, that the, God has to lay it on our hearts. We won't come to that place of ourselves. We, God has to give us that desire, and He will if we're really a child of God. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good. I, hello, Mr. Camping. How are you? Very well, thank you. I'm calling regarding two uh, two things. Uh, two. Well, uh, the guy who called a couple of calls back. Uh, the guy who, who uh, mentioned suicide and those things. Yes. Yeah. I, there's a scripture that I don't exactly know where it's at. It says, come to me, all you that uh, labor. Well, you're thinking of Matthew chapter 11. Okay. Uh, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Which, which chapter is that? That's, uh, I think it's Matthew chapter 11. Let me check. Uh, in, in Matthew 11, verse... Uh, uh, 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now you see, uh, before we're saved, we're desperately trying to get right with God by our good works, about uh, what we do. Uh, and God is saying, no come to Christ uh, uh, Christ is the one 
who has to do all the work. But the problem is, we can't, uh, by nature, we won't come to him. We have to read this in the light of Romans 3, where God says, There is none that seeketh after me, no, not one. We have to read this in the light of John 6, verse 44. No man can come to me except the Father draw him. It is God who has to cause us to come and and take the burden away and uh, so that we're trusting only in him and so we have to wait upon the lord he, because he has to do it but in the meanwhile knowing that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of god we read the bible and read the bible and and try to know everything we can about this marvelous gospel and about the kingdom of god and about our sins and and so on and we're praying oh lord help me to understand oh lord help me to believe and and we, but we have to wait upon the lord because the lord is the only one who makes the decision who he wants to save he's the only one who can save us we can't get ourselves saved mr camping i, I hear what, i understand what you're saying but i didn't really need to hear all of that you didn't have to say all of that I specifically wanted to bring this scripture out for that young man, whoever he is and wherever he is, to consider that wonderful scripture that our Savior says that call that goes out. And when you're feeling, when you're hurting, Mr. Camping, you're an older gentleman, you're an elder, and you've been through a lot. But I can hear in that man's voice, he's a young man. And he's going through things, and he may have be either been through something or whatever. And in that incident that he had that only he knows about, um, he's calling out to our Father and our Savior. We don't need a lot of words and all this Well, stuff. now, excuse me. The, the reason God gives us the Bible is so that we can have truth. And, and it's the truth that sets us free. And we don't want to have truth that is not truth. We want to declare the whole counsel of God. Okay. The fact is, to, uh, to tell this young man, you've got to wait upon the Lord. And in the meanwhile, read the Bible. Read the Bible. There's, there, that is the most wholesome uh, thing possible. Just to say, uh, 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 you know, just read this now and, and somehow everything is going to be all right. Uh, that 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 sounds great, but the fact is he cannot come to Christ unless God draws him, and that's God's business, and he has to know that because the Bible teaches that we shouldn't be afraid to tell the whole counsel of God, and yet at the same time, uh, if 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 God is, has elected him. God will draw him in God's own timetable. That's God's business altogether. I understand. But that's my point exactly. It's the fact that he is listening to this station and listening to a station, a radio station that's pertaining to the Lord, that means, that means that he is calling out. He's not listening to a secular station. He's listening to family radio, the by a, a program that uh, represents our Father. So, again, though, I, I, I suggest that he... I gave him a scripture. When he asked you, you told him just to, in a general term, just to read the Bible, read yeah. the Bible. That was a scripture that he can go to. If, oh. if not, if not nothing else, he could just read it and and let the Lord work on his heart or whatever. Oh, but, I'll buy. I'll buy that. It's always good to read any scripture, and this is a good scripture for anybody to read. But but uh, we want to keep reading and. And, and keep reading and, uh, and praying, but, oh, Lord, help me to be obedient, because he himself cannot become obedient. God is the one who has to incline his heart. And I want to thank you for calling attention to this scripture. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, Brother Camping. Yes. It's been quite a while since I've spoken to you. Um, but over the three and a half years that I've been listening... I think I've talked to you about three times. I'm the woman who always points out that the foundational foundational basis of the Bible is Genesis 1. And God created man in his image and likeness, and he created him very, very good. There are so many points that 
I just wish your open forum really was an open forum on. Because, for instance, the man who just called, many, many times people have called to you hurting and you don't give them specific scriptures to meditate on. So that, I mean, just the fact, like the gentleman said, the fact that they call you means that God is drawing them because it's God who, who draws us. Excuse okay. me, excuse me. I don't know whether God is, call, is, is calling them or not. You can't make that judgment. You cannot do that. And the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for correction, uh, for uh, training in righteousness. And it's true that we may have a favorite scripture here or there, I have listened to the testimony when I used to be an elder in the in the church during the church age, and I would hear testimonies of those who were were making profession of faith, and ask them, now what verses were particularly outstanding in your mind that you feel God used to particularly draw you? And I'm I've always been amazed at the at the variety of verses that were offered. Many times verses were offered that I would never think of it. And so we, we, we don't have to demean any of God's Word. The whole Bible is the Word of God. The main problem is we've got to read the Bible. Read the Bible. And we can get the idea, you know, well, here's a, here's a fine verse to read. And so I read it a hundred times and, and, and I think now I've read the Bible. But, but there's a whole, the Bible is, has got a whole lot of verses in it. So keep reading. Keep reading. And, and uh, you, you'll not only, uh, you'll find uh, uh, many verses that will particularly speak to your heart if God indeed is drawing you. So while I'm thankful that a verse is emphasized, we don't want to demean the Bible in any way. We have to remember the whole Bible from cover to cover, whether you're reading Genesis chapter 1 or Revelation 22 or anything in between, is the Word of God. And, and uh, we, we, we just want to be obedient to what God says. Now may I speak? May I, may I participate on the open forum? Excuse me, what, what, is your, what is your comment? My comment is, all that you've said goes away from where we were. The scriptures, I believe that if a person calls you, God is leading him to do that. If he's, especially if he's aching and wants to know something specific to help him. I'm so surprised that you don't tell people to study every word that Jesus said and realize that Jesus was talking to each and every man. There are too many scriptures, Brother Camping, that you say, oh, um, I haven't studied that because it doesn't fit in with your theology. There no, are too uh, excuse many. Me. No, no, excuse no. me. Excuse me. No, no. I don't, I don't want you to get carried away by this. You know... Uh, the whole Bible is the Word of God. We have Bibles that, that are red-letter editions because somebody thinks that the words of Jesus are more important than the words of Isaiah or the words of the Apostle Paul. And that is absolutely not true. The whole Bible is the Word of God. Holy men of old spoke as God the Holy Spirit moved them. And we don't want to diminish any part of the Bible. The main problem is getting people interested in reading the Bible, reading the Bible, to sit down and, uh, and, and spend some serious time in the Word of God. And uh, there are churches, for example, that only use the New Testament, and they don't use the Old Testament at all. They despise the Bible in that sense because they, they think that the Old Testament isn't for us today. That just is not true. We have to remember that God is in charge of all this, and we just want to read the Bible. And the more we read the Bible, 
if uh, God will apply that word to our hearts in the way that He wants to do it. And the fact that somebody shows an interest in the word, that doesn't mean that God is drawing them necessarily. There are people who who have, got, have obeyed an altar call ten times and they're and they're still they know they're not saved. That doesn't the, the action that we take is doesn't prove that God is drawing us. It may be curiosity or it may be just a an intellectual fear of some kind. But when God finally is going to save someone, that's God's business and we have to leave that with him altogether. The point I'm trying to make is is we do not we do not have a formula by which we can become saved that incur that includes some action that we take. The formula to become saved is God's formula. He is the only one who can save. But thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes. Hello? Yes. Uh, okay, I'm a uh, 62-year-old retired uh, person, and I've uh, just started listening to the radio, and I've heard you uh, many times now, and I have never heard another preacher or anybody else say that it's the end of the church age, and I'm just curious where you're getting that from well I'll tell you this is a product of probably 40 years of very careful study of the Bible uh, uh, 20 years ago I was saying that uh, already then as I earnestly studied the Bible that the church is becoming more decadent that it's it's fa falling away and finally the gospel is going to be silenced in the churches I did not understand at that time at all that God still had another plan called what the Bible calls the latter rain. But, uh, but there's an abundant scriptures that talk about this fact that, that uh, there will come a time when the work of the church has been finished. We see this in many passages. And I've written uh, a shorter document that is available through Family Radio, The End of the Church Age. And I have also written a larger book that is uh, presently being edited and prepared for printing and and uh, hopefully in a month or two you can have a copy uh, of that but right now you can write in if you wish and or call in to family radio and and uh, get what is already available and there are a lot of scriptures already offered in that you give me one that i can write down and look into yes for example read uh, i i uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse uh, 1 through 3. God's Christ is looking at the temple buildings, and he's saying the time will come, there will not be one stone left upon another. Compare that with 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where God indicates the building of the temple, and he says that in that temple, that Christ is the, is the foundation, and then we build in that temple with gold, silver, and precious stones. They are the true believers. And wood, hay, stubble. We have to look upon those as those who thought they were saved but who are not saved. But now Christ is saying that time will come. There will be not one stone left upon another. And, uh, and the context of Matthew 24 shows that he's talking about the end of the world. The disciples ask him, when will your return be in the end of the world? And and then we go on and read in Matthew 24, verse uh, 21, there will be great tribulation such as this world has ever known. And then uh, uh, and the whole chapter is dealing with that subject of the end of the world. And then in verse 24, Christ uh, explains the character of that tribulation, false prophets and false Christs will arise with signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. And we see uh, this happening all over the world today through Gospels that feature signs and wonders and tongues and so on. And there, uh, I'm just scratching the surface, but, or again, we look at Revelation 11. 
and you look at verse 7 and 8, it talks about two witnesses. Uh, and they are the true believers as they bring the gospel throughout the church age. But now they've been killed. Satan has, the beast has overcome them. Uh, because their work has been finished. The work of the church, therefore, has been finished. But then later on we see them standing on their feet and great fear coming upon those who behold them. In other words, they still have a work, but now it's outside of the churches and congregations. Now, uh, there's two other things that that is really on my mind since I've heard you, and, and I think it was yesterday that you were talking about it was impossible for God to take the sins of the whole world. It was not impossible, but that was God's plan. The Bible clearly says that he chose those whom he planned to save, he named them in the Lamb's Book of Life, and the Bible clearly shows that there are those who are not named in that Book of Life, which means he never intended to save him. We read Romans 9, where God says, Jacob I loved, and, ja and Esau I hated. And he made that decision concerning them before they were born, before they had ever done anything good or bad, that God's purposes of election might stand. Uh, again, we we have abundant scriptures that identify with that, even though we don't like it. We don't like it. Right. But we have to let the Bible guide us, not our minds. Isn't it in the Bible where our Lord said, Upon this rock, and he was talking to Peter, I will build my church, and the church will last until the end of time. Excuse me, what church is that? You know, he didn't say that. He says... I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, when we study the Bible, God uses the word church in two ways. He uses it in talking about the, the true believers who are eternally safe and secure in the, in the heavenly church because uh, their sins have all been paid for and... Uh, and uh, the gates of hell, that is, hell has no claim on them because all of their sins have been covered. But on the other hand, he also uses the word church in speaking about a local congregation, as he does in Revelation 2 and Revelation 3. He names seven local congregations there, the church at Ephesus, the church at Laodicea, the church at Smyrna, and so on. And already there he is warning them a church at Ephesus, you've lost your first love, and if you don't repent, I'll remove your candlestick. The church at Laodicea, uh, because you're neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out. The church at Smyrna, you are already dead, even though you still have a few believers within you. And so the local congregation it has no security that it's going to go right till the end. What has security is the eternal church, that, that consists only of those who have truly become saved. Now, in churches today, uh, there are those who speak about a saved membership, assuming that all those who are members have truly become saved. But is that really so? That That's the big question. And from everything we read in the Bible, we know, no, that isn't so. There, There are some within a congregation who are true believers, but there are many who think they are who are not. And that's why the Bible says, examine yourself, whether you truly are in the faith. But I'm sorry we can't visit longer. We have come to the end of our time. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you. Good night.